Hey everybody, welcome to episode 44 of the Ask Tap Show, where we answer your Volkswagen Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about catalyst efficiency faults, buying a salvage title Mark 7, and Mark 7 clutches. Bad news via VW Vortex says, have you discussed clutch upgrades yet for modified stage one to stage three Golf R's and GTI's? I think it would fit nicely in the whole Ask Dap arena. For instance, I've seen you guys in the MQB Facebook group go straight to South Bend stage three endurance clutch on an R and completely bypass a stage two offering. What's Dap selling and who is buying it? Okay, so in regards to Mark 7 clutches, um, first we offer at this time two different versions of clutches. Um, we're looking at possibly offering another one that is a upgraded pressure plate and disc uh, made by Saks that, that uh, we've, we've had some exposure to. It might look into that. Um, aside from that one that we are looking at possibly offering, we have the South Bend version as well as uh, BFI. So South Bend is going to be a little bit more expensive. They're uh, an established brand. They've been around a long time in clutches and they have a really good track record. BFI. Um, they're kind of newer to the clutch game, but they've had pretty good success. They do, uh, if you're not familiar, they do engine mounts um, and clutches, catch cans, a bunch of other stuff like that where they make their products. Um, and then they recently, as of maybe six months to a year ago, got into the clutch game. Um, everybody we've heard from about their stuff is good, good feedback. Um, so, but let's jump into what clutches um, why somebody would jump straight to a stage three instead of maybe going to a stage two clutch on a modified car. I can't speak specifically for the people you're referring to because honestly, you know, I don't know their situation, but I can guesstimate. Um, most likely if you were to jump directly to a stage three, instead of going stage two, depending on the mods of the car, it's probably based on future plans of the vehicle based on how much power they intend to put out or potentially intend to put out. Um, because obviously, anytime you're doing a clutch, first of all, it's buying a clutch in itself is expensive, but then installing it, if you're paying labor, it's really expensive. And even if you're doing it yourself, it's so much work that you wouldn't want to have to replace it again, you know, unnecessarily just based on the fact that you saved maybe 200 bucks, but then you have to buy a new one um, to get to that next level because it starts slipping when you exceed the power that it's rated for. Um, so let's, let's go into the conversation about which one to choose for your vehicle. Um, choosing a clutch is going to be subjective based on a couple things. One, um, what your intending mods are for the vehicle, probably long-term. I wouldn't say super long-term because, you know, for me, I've been around in the automotive business a long time. Everybody had the idea that they're going to, they're going to upgrade their turbo but realistically it never happens. So building a car for a big turbo car, you gotta kind of be honest with yourself, especially when you're doing a clutch, to know, am I really gonna do that? Or is it something that's kind of a pie in the sky dream that I'm likely not gonna have happen? Um, because if you build a clutch for that, you may end up with a clutch that's uh, much heavier um, than you really need it. And you're not gonna be happy with that as a daily driver long-term. And I assume most people have a Mark 7 are going to have a daily driver car. So um, selecting the correct one for your power rating is going to be where that uh, clutches are all rated for specific torque ratings. So if you intend on exceeding that torque rating, um, then you would next go to the next level. Or even if you get close, I would say you might want to consider jumping to the next level up just to ensure that you don't have any slippage issues once you get near or exceed that power just by a little bit. So you want to give yourself a little bit of elbow room. Um, so the next thing I would say is what maybe somebody might be asking, how do I know what kind of power the mods I'm doing are going to hit, um, put out? And you know, there's tons of research out there. Manufacturers all put out information about power. Um, you know, Unitronic, um, they have power ratings for all the stuff. So you could take a look if you jump from each, let's say, stage one, the stage one plus, the stage two, and then the stage two plus, which on the Mark 7 would be an IS38. Um, you can see what the power levels are, so it can give you a gauge for um, what you want to do 
clutch wise for each one of those levels and you know again be honest with yourself about where you're actually going to, going to get in that to determine which clutch you should choose because number one you want something that's going to be drivable but still hold the power um, that you need so hopefully that answers your question uh, and feel free to leave any comments uh, with feedback about that southern jetta via vw vortex says will my check engine light bulb eventually burn out so, so this question was asked on one of our Vortex Ask Dap threads. It was kind of a joke, but I figured I'd follow up and say uh, check engine lights on most current day cars are LEDs, so the likelihood they're going to burn out, they probably have a 10 to 15 year uh, life. So I would say you're going to have a check engine light for a long time unless you fix it. So I would say uh, fix your check engine light instead of... Uh, instead of hoping it'll burn out. Or you can always do the, uh, the tape method where you put tape over it so you don't have to look at it. VQ Golf R via VW Vortex says, is this wrecked Mark 7 GTI a good buy? How much do you think to fix this? Cost is 6,200. Okay, so this question was actually, a thread was posted specifically about this. This is a salvage title car that's been in an accident that is for sale for 6,200 bucks. Um, I'll show you, take a look at this picture here. This is the ad from the site, obviously free advertising for them from us. Um, the, I would say if you're asking a question about buying a salvage title car, you probably should not even consider it. If you have to ask, you probably don't have the skill set to actually do this and doing so will get you in such a big world of hurt. And here's a few reasons why. Number one, uh, if a car is a salvage title, which means when they got into an accident, the insurance company deemed the cost to fix exceeded 70% of the value of the vehicle, which means if you made me guesstimate that's a 2015 GTI, let's say whatever, let's say it has 20K on it and the car is worth 18 grand, just throwing a number off the top of my head. That means that that car is going to cost more than 70% of 18 grand to fix it, which means that's a huge number to repair. Now, keep in mind that is retail. So the only people who probably would be interested in buying a car like this would be see someone who owns a body shop um, or they're a body guy and they just want to fix it on the side and flip the car. Um, but also keep in mind, if you fix a car that has a salvage title, they are basically worthless. I mean, it's super hard. I would say on average, a salvage title car probably has 30% or less value, and, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm just throwing numbers off the top of my head, but um, value is tremendously diminished um, by having a salvage title because there's a big question mark and unknown as to how it was repaired, um, what the likelihood that it's gonna need further repairs, um, and a bunch of other things like that. So I would say definitely avoid a salvage title car. The other thing uh, that I would say people might wanna buy a car like this would be is, if you were to be looking for a trans transplant car, so let's say you have a Mark 7 or a um, you know old car, like I have a Corrado. Let's say you have an old Corrado and the engine's dead, like mine is, um, and you want to buy a car to swap the entire drivetrain, interior, engine, all the whole shebang, and just plug it into one car. That would be a decent option, although the car is really new, so you know 6,200 bucks is a lot for a transplant car, um, but that would be probably the only other scenario that I would say consider buying a car like that because you get a lot more value and you can sell off whatever the other pieces of the car are um, for parts. So hopefully that answers your question and I would say definitely avoid salvage auto cars unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. Zeus 2013 via YouTube says, Hey Paul, what's your stance on the 10,000 mile intervals that VW suggests for oil changes? It's synthetic, so it should be able to last that long. Many owners claim that this is a scam to cause eventual damage to the engine and should still change every three to 5,000. I mean, we're not in the 90s anymore using crude oil, right? Thanks. Okay, so for oil change intervals, I covered this already once before, um, but basically here's the deal. Um, I would recommend this. If you own the car and you're planning on keeping it long-term, I would recommend 5,000 mile intervals. That's my personal preference. It's not really based on any uh, complex data or anything. I just feel like changing it more often seems to be a better choice, especially if you want the longevity you're looking for. Um, 
if you are leasing the car. I would say change it every 10. Change it the minimum required because who cares? You're, cha you're trading the car in when you're done um, and it doesn't really matter. In regards to um, the manufacturers extending service intervals to create failures, I mean, that seems really tinfoil hat. And I've seen people say things like this before and it's just so crazy because there's no way that an engineer designs an engine and changes a service interval specifically intended to make the engine fail. It's just not gonna happen. Um, do I believe that they've, they've changed the intervals over the years? No question. And mostly I would say it's because of the oil quality is better and they've deemed it to be unnecessary um, based on all those parameters. Also, the other thing is that German cars, and I know because I, you know, I used to be in dealers, so I've been in meetings where they talk about this. The, there's a huge perception in the market that, let's say, owning a VW is the cost to maintain it is more expensive. Um, and at that time, I was at a meeting right before I left to start my company um, in 2012 that they were talking about there was a survey um, that was done to compare all the manufacturers and cost of maintenance average. Um, and I wanna say Honda was like uh, average of like 350 a year. You know, Honda, Toyota were all kind of around that same being the lowest or on the low end. Um, and then VW, I wanna say the average yearly cost was roughly around $15 more per year to own a VW than it was to Honda. So it was more, but it was not this huge number that is perceived by the market. Um, and so I'm sure that part of the reason why they pushed back the intervals was, was one, it wasn't required based on a lot of the parameters and testing they had done. Um, and previously, you know, if, if you're familiar with Germans, they have a really strict set of uh, strict mindset. So probably my guess would be the intervals were unnecessary for all the years before that. And then they realize they've done enough testing and, and stuff to determine those were not necessary. We can transition to longer intervals. And keep in mind, you know, VW and Audi are at 10K. BMW is at like 15 or 18,000 on some of their oil changes. So, um, you know, to say that they're the longest, VW is not even close to the longest when you talk about other manufacturers. So um, definitely not out. So keep in mind, if you own the car, I prefer myself uh, sooner intervals. If you're not planning to keep the car long term, just do the required uh, maintenance by the manufacturer. Narwhals via VW Vortex says, Mark 7 fuel filter, it's in the tank, so how do you clean it for normal maintenance? Or do you replace the whole fuel pump assembly? So Mark 7 fuel filters, uh, you are correct, they are not intended to be serviced. Uh, they are not a serviceable item on that car. You can't even purchase a fuel filter, so it would be part of the fuel pump assembly, at least at this time. Um, could you clean it? You could, you could pull the pump out and figure out what part of it is the, the filter assembly and try to clean that out. I'm just not sure it's necessary. Um, the one thing I'll say is, and I don't really know the answer to this, and I, I'm really almost interested to wonder if there's any engineers or anybody watching who might know this. Um, a few years ago, VW changed to certain models. They don't have fuel filters anymore. Um, I think the Tiguan doesn't, the CC I know doesn't, um, and there's a few other models that all don't have fuel filters. And I'm not sure why that happened because for years we've always had fuel filters and all of a sudden we've transitioned to where now apparently cars don't need fuel filters anymore. So um, I don't think they did that arbitrarily. There must be a reason why, I just don't know it. Um, so I'd be curious if anybody has any feedback about that, you know, leave in the comments below and keep in mind, do me a favor, don't leave opinions or anything like that. I wanna, if you have actual facts about it, uh, make sure you comment. Otherwise, you know, debating over which one, which one, what the reason why isn't really helpful for anybody. Um, I prefer to stick with facts. Gompertz via VW Vortex says, Hi all, my 2010 VW CC 3.64 motion has a catalytic efficiency code error. Dealership has quoted three to 4,000 to fix. Naturally, I'm skeptical. The car is 150,000 kilometers on it. It has no issues revving or accelerating hard, so I can't fathom a car that has been fed premium and full synthetic its whole life would have plugged cats. 
I would rather try my luck at O2 sensors first, or am I wasting my time? If I replaced the O2 sensors and had to guess which ones were causing issues, would I be better to start with the ones before or after the cap? My understanding is that the car has four sensors, one before and one after each cap. Can I pull the sensors and clean them? Okay, so in regards to cats. Uh, cats on that car. First of all, there are two different cats on that car, but they're sold as one unit. So, um, that's part of the reason why you're looking at kind of a big expense on that. But I'll say this, um, in regards to your discussion about using premium fuel and, and uh, mobile 1040, um, the fault you have is not for a plugged cat and it's for a bad cat which means catalyst efficiency below threshold, um, or at least that's my understanding of what default you have. If that's the case, what it's saying is that the catalytic converter is not functioning to the optimum performance required for the cat to be doing its job. That doesn't mean it's plugged and the engine can't run properly because that's what would happen with a plugged cat, but it's saying that the cat material itself is not doing its job so it needs to be replaced for emissions reasons. Um, in regards to the cost, three to four thousand um, dollars, obviously because you're talking about kilometers, you're not in the U.S., so I can't really say specifically about your area because pricing will often vary um, based on country. But I can tell you, in the U.S., that cat uh, from us is around twelve hundred bucks. I think it's eleven, or I'm sorry, uh, retail price is around twelve hundred bucks our cost would be, I don't know, somewhere around probably a thousand bucks. Um, that's for a reman cat, so there would be a core charge on that, which would be roughly around $200. Um, so I think it's 210 is to the core charge. Unfortunately, uh, pretty much most VW cats, if you're anybody who's not familiar, are remanufactured. So they're, they come from VW Direct, but they're considered a remanufactured part, so you have to swap out the old one for the new one. Um, we'd be glad to help you, but unfortunately the cost to ship that huge pipe with all the cats and stuff would be pretty expensive. Although depending on, you know, if we're talking about three grand they're charging you, it might be worth it uh, for you to buy from us as opposed to paying local. Um, but three to 4,000 is pretty high. I don't know if maybe they're doing the cat and both rear O2 sensors or maybe all the O2 sensors. I don't, I don't really know. Um, should you try the O2 sensors first? I would say probably not. That's just my personal opinion from my experience. Most often um, O2 sensors don't um, cause that, but they can. So um, most often when you get catalyst efficiency faults, it's because the cat is actually a problem. That may or may not be the case. The one thing I might want to tell you to look at is check out if the rear O2 sensors have the same part number on them, and I didn't check this before shooting this, but um, if they are, are the same, you can swap them side to side, and I assume that you only have one bank. Usually you'll get either bank one or bank two faults, um, and what that means is that uh, bank one would be one side of the engine, or one of the cats, bank two would be the other cat. So um, if you have a bank one or bank two fault, you would be able to determine which side it is, and then if you swap them and you see the problem moves to one of the other sides, then you would know that an oxygen sensor is responsible and then you don't have to replace the whole cat. Um, that would be my advice. Hopefully you can get your situation resolved, but yeah, that's, that seems a little bit high uh, for that type of repair. Thank you for watching episode 44 of the Ask App Show, where we answer your Volkswagen ID questions. If you have any feedback about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.